All right, I would like now to take this opportunity to welcome our Executive Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs and our Provost, Dr. Hilda Helley. Thank you, John. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our GRCC ESPs. I am delighted that we have set a day aside for your professional development. Life on campus is a bit quieter this week, if you didn't notice, you know, perhaps for some of us more than for others. Um, so this is a really fine opportunity to gather together and to share some ideas on the topic of our development day, resilience. Hmm. For all of us at GRCC, for ESPs, for faculty, for administrator, administrators, students are the reason why we exist as an institution, why we continue to function as a service to the community, why we get out of bed in the morning and move to offices and workstations and begin our days. You really don't have to take notes about any of this. So <laughs> just just re re relax, sit back, relax, enjoy the flight, OK? <laughs> Um, without students, we would not have a college. But without support staff, the college would not and could not function. I wonder what they're doing today now that you're all here. Yeah. The many details of this school's operation require a staff with the resolve and the resilience and the institutional history to move forward to continue serving in the challenging times of record enrollments and in trying times of technological changes and updates and upgrades, and even in the uprooting moments of moving offices from one building to another. Who does GRCC rely on these times of growth and upgrades and changes of address? We rely on you our support staff. And while I don't want to add anything else to your duties, I know that some of you are clearly qualified to present to groups of our DRCC students your experiences on resilience or what hardiness means to you. As you know, we get some students who lack confidence in their skills and in their abilities who feel a bit unsteady on campus and unsure of themselves in the classroom. And we have set up an introduction to college class for them. This class allows students to analyze how they will continue to move forward despite setbacks, to not give up until uh, after an illness or after failing an exam, to develop the conviction that their actions influence the outcome of a situation, that through challenge, commitment, and control, they can achieve their goals. Many of you are uniquely qualified to share how you responded in times of considerable stress to help in your office, your department, our college, to thrive and to succeed. And to do so while maintaining a smile on your, sleep, on your, on your lips and um, a song in your heart. Now, that is the mark of a resilient or hardy personality. It cannot be bottled. It cannot be bought and sold. But oh, how very, very precious is this quality of resilience. And many individuals here today embody resilience. You make others better by your actions and your example and your service. As a representative of this group, I would like one of you to join me here this morning for a special tribute, a tribute about unwavering resilience. And I would like to ask Candy Norder to come forward, please. I'm good. 
Okay, here is someone <laughs> who makes things work, who does what needs to be done, who volunteers, who shows up for athletic events, who makes sure the names of absent faculty are spelled properly in those days. <laughs> yeah. How many times do we not do that? <laughs> <laughs> who helps stuff the thousands of faculty evaluation forms into envelopes, and that is not even her job. Okay. I thought it was. Candy, <laughs> sorry, whoops, whoops. <laughs> Candy exudes a calm, even keel, steady as she goes, soothing demeanor. Mm. Student complaints will not bring her down. <laughs> <laughs> They're so fun. Most importantly, she keeps Patty on track so that Patty doesn't mess up so badly, okay? And those are Patty's words, uh. not Candy's. <laughs> And Candy continues to exhibit resilience as she maintains a hope that one day, maybe one day, she will organize Patty's filing system. <laughs> a daunting challenge. Yeah, yes. Misty gave up. <laughs> she kind of did. I know. Candy, on behalf of everybody oh. here today, we want to give you this award for unwavering resiliency. Oh. And it comes apart. So I see that. <laughs> you want to say it. something? Candy. Wow. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> My goodness. Very cool. OK, you kissed it all. It's all right. <laughs> this is really cool. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, Patty's office will be Patty's office, and we will do what we can with it. And, um, you know, as far as spelling absences, we did ask them to spell their last names when they call in. It's we can't understand them. So that is the other reason they're spelled incorrectly. And thank you for your corrections, secretaries, because, you know, we need that. Um, this is really cool, and um, it's going to be a great year this year for all of us. So, everybody, thank you. Thank you, my dear. It is important today to come together and to share the wealth of our experiences. GRCC supports your professional development and recognizes the value you bring to our mission, to our daily operations, to our students' well-being and success. Perhaps today we are engaging formally in what you do informally all the time, to network. As you look around the room, how many friends do you have? Just take a look. How many friends do you have here? How many people do you rely on for guidance, for insight, for help, for training? How many questions do we have in a given day about what we are doing here, and, what, and who do we turn on to for answers? Look around. Do you see any books? Any search engines, any Rolodexes here? <laughs> what you see is your network intelligence. Okay. These contacts and connections provide you with some of the nuances of procedures, okay. as well as the idiosyncrasies of certain individuals. You know, like providing a hot, not a cold lunch for the provost. She is very <laughs> annoying about that. I've heard. <laughs> I've heard about that. This, this network provides you with personalized information tailored to you and to your specific needs. These relationships help you sift through mountains of data to concentrate on what is actionable and what is relevant. Part of becoming a resilient individual is embracing the fact that we rely on each other, that we think better thoughts when we dialogue with others. One of my favorite poets um, from Uruguay, Mario Benedetti, wrote a poem entitled Me Gusta La Gente, or I Like People, in which he lists the qualities he admires in a person some of the very same qualities of a resilient individual. And he says, I like vibrant people, the ones you don't have to push or tell them what to do, who know what to do, and they do it. I like people capable 
of measuring the consequences of their actions, who do not leave solutions to chance. I like people who think that teamwork among friends produces more than chaotic individual efforts. I like people who know the importance of happiness. I like frank and sincere people, capable of opposing the decision of a superior with calm and reasonable arguments. I like faithful and persistent people who never waver when it comes to achieving goals and objectives. I like people who work for results. With these people, or with people like this, I commit myself to anything because with these people at my side, I am rewarded immensely. While most of you may not have heard of one of my favorite poets, most of you very well know one of my favorite mentors. It is my firm belief that if we are to become resilient in our professional and personal lives, we need to learn from the experiences of others to cultivate the intelligence of our networks. I am so happy that our former president, Ann Mulder, has accepted our invitation to return to speak with you as part of our professional development. And I need to tell you about, about, about something that happened. You know, shortly after faculty learning day in January, uh, Deb and Art and uh, myself, we were having lunch. And, and they suggested, you know, it would be nice if we do something like this for our ESPs. And, you know, we started brainstorming. So what would we do? What could we bring? What, you know, what, what could we do? And it was like, like this, that, you know, that came the name of Ann Mulder. So I got my phone, my iPhone out, and I texted her, you know, I need you. That was my, my text. And I sent it. I was going to explain it right away, you know, what. Well, before I could even type the next sentence, the phone was ringing. What is it? What do you need? What happened? <laughs> True to form, ever at the ready, and knows resilience. She has experience of being the only woman at the table. She knows what it's like to move ahead despite setbacks. Even in retirement, Anne was ready to respond to the college's need for her leadership and return to serve as our interim president in 2008. I benefited greatly from working with her during her presidency and have continued to learn from her. And that's what I hope for all of you today, that you may learn from a master about resilience. Please join me in welcoming Anne Mulder. nice uh, you know I have to tell you a story well I'll tell you a lot of stories because that's what I am I'm a storyteller and I will uh, move away from the mic provided someone helps me down because I'm no longer graceful anymore <laughs> but um, first of all how happy I am to be back with all of you you have no idea what this means to me to have been asked back Hilda thank you from the time I walked in the college when I was asked to serve as interim president and Melt, Melt had met Hilda, I knew that I had met someone very, very special indeed. I knew that she had a heart that would embrace so many of you in such a very special way. She embraced my heart. And while she says that I uh, have taught her, may I assure you I have learned from her. And that's part of what it is to be a mentor as well. We learn from our mentees. They teach us. And ultimately, they replace us. But the legacy lives on forever. You are always in my heart, Hilda. And don't ever text me again saying I need you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was hysterical. My God, what's wrong? <laughs> you know? I'll be there. Get a <laughs> I want to thank two other very special people, too. I want to thank Deb and Art. Art, 
you have handled all my neuroses in my trips back. <laughs> Flying back and forth, Grand Rapids is not an easy town to get to. Do you know that? There is no direct, well, there is Allegiant, which flies only two days a week, you know, at certain prescribed times, and that's that. So getting here, when our, how many times did you change my airline ticket? Don't tell me. I don't want to know, but I, I, I had to convince him that it, 37 minutes in Atlanta, how many of you have ever been to the Atlanta airport? <laughs> Impossible, will not be happening. So I appreciate all that you have done, the kindness and the, the funny notes. I Thank you so much. And Deb, you have been a friend for many, many years. Um, we have probably one of the longest DNAs in the college here. And you have worked for some remarkable people. Boy, you may be the luckiest person in the room. And, uh, but they also have learned from you. And thank you so much for all that you have done for me this trip. And for the two of you, it shows entirely how brilliant you are. Absolutely brilliant that you selected me. I want to thank you for that. <laughs> That was just, just thank you so much. You know, when, when, when Hilda said to me, we're going to talk about resilience, I thought, well, my God, at 77, just getting up in the morning is a resilient <laughs> thing, you know. I feel a great deal like the, um, uh, the um, uh, did any of you ever see the stage play Follies? Um, I was talking with Fred Sabalski about it last night. Follies has the, um, there are a group of the old actresses that had been in the Follies that sang, and there's this fabulous song, a woman named Mary Stiles sang. I always loved Mary anyway. I'll tell you a Grand Rapids story. She'd been married to a state senator, a United States senator from here, and uh, when they tore down the old courthouse, Mary changed herself to the ball that was they were using to wreck it, you know, and for two to three days they could not swing the ball because Mary had chained herself to that. She did not want the courthouse to go. Ultimately, uh, deciding on a wiser course of action, she unchained herself <laughs> and lived with it, but that was, you know, it was a pers an act of great courage. But Mary had a fabulous voice. Um, she uh, sang the song, I'm still here, I'm still here, I'm still here. And I think that I sing that every morning to myself when I wake up in Florida. <laughs> Aren't you glad that I came back too? I brought you weather. Is this? <laughs> Hello. Notice that I am dressed in the gray that I thought would be the sky. <laughs> no, no. It's just wonderful to uh, uh, be back here on these bright, sunny days and uh, to walk through because I don't think there's anything quite like a Michigan spring. Everybody talks about Michigan Falls, but there is something incredibly magical about a Michigan spring. As you, the, the, the light green that changes to white, that changes to pink, and there are just this, this cacophony of color that is, is so marvelous, and every morning you wake up with that. The only thing I'm worried about is that there'll be some blasted ice storm that's gonna <laughs> kill the flowers that have already come up, but it's a wonderful thing. I wanna tell you, too, how great it is to see your faces. So many of you, I do remember. And while I may not remember the names, I remember you. And I remember your presence. And some of you have been in my life for a long time, Kathy. They have been here for a long, long time, Penny. A lot of you have been around, and who, uh, several of you have been here. I, 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 I thank you for, uh, and forgive me. Uh, I do see better, by the way. I had cataract surgery. I have to tell you that story too. I mean, after I looked at my eyes and I suddenly saw these bags. I said to the doctor, when did they come? He said, did you cause this after the surgery? And he said, absolutely not. You know, I wasn't gonna pay him, that was another story. I mean, <laughs> you created these bags. He said, no, that was not the case. So anyway, enough of this, enough of this foolishness and talk, but that's a part of who I am, as you know. I like stories, I like, Humor, I like fun, I like to see us laugh, and I like to see us love. That's a part of what it's about. Uh, it, Lily, you'll laugh. Debbie uh, DeBride made me sing to her uh, before I left. With the song I used to was, show me the way to go home, and that's what we used to do before we left the office every night. Uh, and so, our good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go, that's what I had to sing. So it's great to be back here, it is great. Uh, resilience for me means so many things, and I'm going to talk with you all about what resilience means to you uh, as well, because as I, uh, as I walked the streets of Grand Rapids, that sounds a little strange, doesn't it? <laughs> as I was walking downtown, I realized I had been street walking for 55 years, yes, that was it. 
and that you got you got to know. But I, I sat there. I'm staying down at City Flats, which is a wonderful little place to sit down uh, to stay. It's it's ecologically sound. I, I, I don't really well. I, I do care about that, but <laughs> but but I loved the location because I look out the windows and it was Steckety's. Do any of you remember Steckety's? Oh my goodness, and I thought, if, if I go in that back door and turn right, I'll find the pantyhose. I know exactly where to go. And you know, your mind is there, but I walked in, and, and then I go into Schuler. It's a Schuler's book now. It's changed, the reconstituated. I'm in, I'm in Fox's Jewelers, and I'm thinking, I wonder what Tom had on the top floor here, you know, where we are. You know, what was it like? And you see the town going through all of these incredible reconfigurations, and it was a very joyful thing for me because I realized the town is really, it's, it's still coming back. And isn't that a gracious and glorious thing? Uh, it, it's back, and, and I love that. And I know you must love that as well as you look at it, and you look at the economic forecasts and the things they're saying, you know, Grand Rapids is making this, this, this step back. And I have to tell you, the lip dub, <laughs> which went viral, made such a, um, my granddaughter, who is now a freshman at the University of, no, uh, so, excuse me, a sophomore at the University of North Florida, has decided that she is going to use that uh, for the 40th anniversary of North Florida's college, and she has already enlisted the president of the college and others. They're doing that for uh, University of North Florida. She said, well, you see, my family is from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Let me show you this, you know. And I think how proud she is of that uh, uh, particular experience and how wonderful that was. I walked through the halls of college the other day, and I was up at uh, uh, the, the campus, at the DeVos campus. That was a very special experience for me, because one of the things that I did was I did get the board to buy it. You all, Dr. Ender, the rest of you, got it to come together into this incredible way, but I thought it was absolutely magnificent. It exceeded my dreams. It exceeded the dreams that I had. What you've done in Whitehall and at Sneedon is just remarkable. And I know it's been a pain in the rear to move up there. I, jo I don't even like, you know, changing a closet. So this, is, this has been a huge task for you. And you've done it well. You've done it extremely well. And I know getting used to the changes may be difficult, but it's, it's beautiful. I've always said that the hall spoke to me. There's a DNA in the halls. I've, I've known it for so long. Remember, I started there in 1959 or 1960. So I do understand the DNA that really permeates the halls. You re might remember that when I was here, I uh, was asked to do uh, Dr. Sweats's uh, eulogy which I was, was his, when his wife called me and, and, and Van, God bless her, said, and make it funny, Ann. And I thought, okay, a funny eulogy for me, so that wouldn't be too hard. I was, I was able to do that. But I always think I hear people in the halls. I walk the halls. I hear the people in the halls. I see them. And that is a piece of, of the DNA of that institution, to be sure. But it's also a piece of the resilience that is there, because it extends the story, if you will, extends beyond us. It, and it will go on beyond us. So that is, that is a piece of the, uh, of, of the story, understanding the story of the college, understanding your story within the college, understanding the story of the thousands of others who have come there. And somehow, we have been blessed to all be part of that, uh, of that, of that remarkable interchange. Do you ever feel that sometimes when you're there? I think you probably do when you, when you meet with the students and see the students because they, they are the ones whose stories go on forever and forever and forever. They are the ones that you meet years later and they say to you, do you know what this college meant to me? Do you know what you meant to me? Do you know what you meant to me? Well, let's go back. Stories of resilience. When I think of resilience, I think of a few people in my life that uh, told me stories uh, about themselves or, or their stories became examples for me. One of the things that I remember was a young man named John Hockenberry. Do any of you remember John? John was from Grand Rapids, Michigan. He was a tall and handsome young man. He sang and did a lot of work at the Civic Theater. 
uh, and Grand Rapids, and his mother, Nancy, actually taught a program for us for adult foster care uh, parents here. She was uh, responsible for this program. We'd receive money from the uh, State Department to do this. And John um, was a brilliant young man and went to the University of Chicago and was on spring break hitchhiking, as kids did in those days, hitchhiking back across the United States. Um, and he and his buddy were picked up by two young women who were from Stevens College and they were driving through the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania and um, the young driver fell asleep and went over the side of a cliff. She was killed. The other two walked away completely unscathed, and John was left a permanent paraplegic. It was in Williamstown, I think, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. And Nancy called me, and I still hear her voice. I can still hear her voice when she said, we are driving now to, uh, to see John. And she tells me the story, and John has told me as well. When she walked into the room, she burst into tears. There was her firstborn. There he was, tied to tubes. There he was, unable to walk again. And his, he simply looked at his mother and he said, do not cry. Some people spend a lifetime wondering what they have to do with their life. I know what my goal is now. I know what I have to do. I think that is a marvelous story in resilience. If you go on and read the books, the many books that John has read, written, if you can recall uh, Dateline NBC where he sat as one of the um, uh, commentators, if you are in New York and turn to certain radio channels now where he has his own station, and if you look at his two sets of twins running around the house, you will understand that John Hockenberry has led a resilient life, not stopped by any of the things that defined him. That would have defined him. No, that was not to be the case. Well, that's a remarkable story of resilience, of course, and we know other tales of that kind as well. I think of one that was more personal to me. I think of my own mother, widowed at age 36. I did not know what that meant until I was 36 myself and realized what she must have endured. A willful 12-year-old, that would be me, a less... Um, a more, a, a, a probably calmer young man, which would be my brother, and a 16, and he was 11, and my 16-month-old sister. And I think of what her life came to be for all of us, because as we grew up, she made it abundantly clear to us, abundantly clear, that it was as important for us to, for her daughters, as it was for her son, to have an education, because she was the first woman in her family educated beyond high school. And she said, no, 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 you will have an education. And may I tell you that from all of her group of children, descendants, uh, we are all college-educated men and women. We are doctors. We are attorneys. Uh, we are a, um, geologists. We are teachers. And the list goes on. And we owe it all to a woman who said, that is what you will be. And she did not let, in the 1940s, uh, uh, she did not let that definition uh, define her or define us. It was an act of resilience. She often told me that uh, at the time of my father's death, she had a total of $800. And that um, uh, my grandfather insisted that that be the rent for, the, for, for when, when we came back to live with him in Kentucky and how she worked to, to make uh, a life possible for all of us. I don't ever think that we felt we sacrificed anything. I know she did. She always made us feel incredibly rich. I think about my own life, and when I think about um, uh, the changes that have occurred throughout the course of my life, um, and the, the, the question of resilience can be talked about from many, many uh, perspectives. I can talk about personal resilience. I can talk about professional resilience. Um, and I can talk about institutional resilience because I have been a part of all of that kind of experience uh, within my own life. But I want to stop just a minute and I want to ask you, 
What constitutes resilience to you? When you hear the word, what does it mean? And you've got to talk. I can stand here a long time. <laughs> what, what is resilience? I'm, I'm sorry? Bounce to bounce back. To bounce back. Any examples of that? Bouncing back? Anybody else? Bouncing back? What else? Think. I can't hear. Someone who refuses to give up. Someone who refuses to give up, even when they should, maybe, huh? <laughs> or when you think, how can you, how can you do that? I refuse to give up. Anything else? Come on. I'm sorry? The ability to accept change. Uh, that's tough, isn't it? Why do you think it's so hard for us to accept change? Oh, it's so much easier to stay in the status quo. You are aware that status quo means you're already dying. <laughs> do you understand that? Status quo means you're already dying. What else, OK? Sticking to your principles. That's an interesting, that, that is, that, that, that's an important thing. Why do you say that, Penny? Yeah. One of the things that I did when I became president at Lake Michigan College, I was leaving here, um, I decided that I would develop a set of management assumptions on how I would lead and what I would, uh, and what I would do. And I, I, do, I, built it, uh, I built this set of assumptions uh, based upon, um, actually I was a phenomenological researcher at the University of Michigan. That was, I studied phenomenon. And I didn't really care about um, the statistics, who's in the business office, the statistics classes, you know, that they take. I just hate that. I don't care. The t uh, chi square, all of those things, you know, Z scores. Every time it said Z scores, I'd fall asleep. Z. Mm. I hated it. I hated it. It was the only class in college. I'll have to tell you this story. Kathy might remember it. Uh, I was um, uh, assistant dean of continuing education for a while, and Dr. Sh Dean Schroll uh, was here at the time, and I had to be in charge of the evening college. Well, I was taking a class from a Dr. Collette at the University of Michigan, and he uh, was the most boring teacher I've ever been to in my class in my entire life. You know, it was like, kill me now. Don't make me go. So I finally thought, I've got to drop out of this course. It's just awful. I can't stand it. I, it I, how could I do that in my doctoral work? It was very simple. I started, we had a loudspeaker system at that time where you would hear the voice over the loudspeaker. And I said, make sure you call me out every night at 7.20. <laughs> and finally, I went to Dr. Collette and said, it's clear that I'm not going to be able to continue this here. But thank you so much for the opportunity. Filled up that form, took my first W in college and waited until, to take the statistics class until I had um, found enough Xanax that I could sit through something <laughs> like this. You know, How would I be able to measure that? You know, It was an incredible thing. Um, but these are the kinds of things that you talk about here, the personal resilience, the bouncing back, the doing this. How many of you would think that you would say that resilience is a matter of choice? Why would I say that? Why would I say resilience is a matter of choice? Can you hear me now? If I, if I do this, it's on. Can you hear me now? Why, why would you say, why would, you, why would I say it's a matter of choice? It's your, will to make those it's your will to make those changes. You can, you can, wh what? You can choose not to be resilient. Do you know people that choose that? Do you know people that choose that? Some of them you may work with. I call them the living dead. They're in the room with you sometimes. You know, that's a terrible thing to say, but in truth, they choose, they choose not to bounce back. They choose not to find joy in what it is that they're doing. Am I correct? You, do, do you know what I mean? 
They choose to wallow in it just to be depressed. Is that, is, it's, it's okay. They choose to say, oh, I hate this change. I, I, I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm, I'm miserable. And you know what? Keep that quiet. Other people, you know, that, that's, a, that's a piece of it. I would never have been a good therapist because I would simply say to some, oh, sh shape up, stop it. <laughs> Hello. I, I, your mother didn't do this to you. You'd have pissed me off, too. You know? <laughs> I mean, really. So, I mean, that's, that's a piece of it. Do you know what I'm saying? I could never, never, where's Tina? You would not hire me. John, you would not hire me, would you know? And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. I, when I think of resilience, let me tell you three stories of resilience. And again, it involves kind of a physical thing. I am uh, the advisor for the master's program, and I teach a lot of doctoral classes at Florida Atlantic University. We have a cohort with Palm Beach State College, in which, uh, which was, was one of the community colleges. The community colleges in Florida have now become state universities, and they are offering some four-year degrees. And by the way, the world has not fallen into hell because of that. <laughs> so you just need to know that. Um, but they, um, uh, the, at Palm Beach State, I have a number of the students that I've worked with because I've worked in, in an advisory and consultant capacity with a number of their staff there. Um, uh, my colleague Deborah Floyd and I, I would do this. We work and teach leadership seminars with them. Well, we, um, uh, one of the women that I absolutely adore is the, one of the associate deans there. And she is just, when you walk into Diane Bufano's office, there is an aura of graciousness. There's candy out for people. People come in to seek her. Uh, there are faculty that are coming in all of the time just to say hello to Diane, just to touch Diane because she's there. She's just a remarkable person. Last summer, I was teaching a course in the Organization and Administration of Higher Education, and Diane came in. And she seemed a little agitated, and she said, Anne, I need to talk with you. Diane had been diagnosed with her third round of a very rare kind of cancer. And her eyesight was uh, being seriously affected by this. She said, I can get through this, however. I'm going to wear a patch over my eye because I'm seeing double and triple. And then when I have to go, is there any way I can make up the work? It was just, it was like, I, you know, I finally said to her, you know, Diane, you're just being here is an A. That's just the way it is. I am not going to put stipulations and rules on you because of what you're giving back to me and what you're doing for yourself. Well, she went through one of the most invasive, frightening kinds of procedures that anyone could with a butter knife laser surgery that went into right into her brain and cut out this uh, um, tumor. And I'm happy to tell you, she is making remarkable progress, not for the first time, not for the second time, but for the third time. She is a story in resilience. She is a story in resilience, and her attitude remains the same. This is a person that, for me, has become a beacon of light. This is a person of remarkable resilience. So we think about those kinds of individuals in our life, and I invite you to think about those kinds of individuals in your life because they are there, are they not? They are there, are they not? They are the stories that keep you going day after day, time after time. Now, I ask you to look around the room. There are people in this room that have and bring to you that same kind of resilience, are there not? Have you told them that lately? During the course of this day, I want you to walk up to at least one person and say to them, you may not know this, but this is what you have brought to me. Can you do that for me today? Can you do that? Will you do that for me? Can you find someone now? And I want it to be, you know, someone that would least suspect it. Someone that would least suspect it. And at the end of the day, see how much better you are going to feel about yourself and about your own backing back. Because you see another thing about resilience. Resilience is a matter of giving, not getting. Does that make sense? It is a matter of giving and not getting. Why would I say that? Why would I say that? Come on, it's not the preacher. It is kind of a biblical thing in a way, isn't it, though? 
giving rather than receiving. Do you have the opportunity to give in the, your position where you are? Do you know how many students come to you in great need of a gift of giving, the gift of giving? Do you know how blessed you are to be in a position in a college where you are able to give? And it's not easy, is it, all of the time? It is not easy. On the days that you feel the most rotten, on the days that, uh, that Patty's pile is piled <laughs> up higher than ever, on those kinds of days, you don't necessarily want to even be bothered. But giving makes a difference. And you find yourself smiling about that, don't you? Sometimes you find yourself thinking, that, that was worth every minute. That was worth every minute to be able to give, to do that. And you know what? You never know, you never know who brings you to the, who, who's brought you to the top. You never have any idea whose lives you touched. You never have any idea whose lives you touched. I was uh, with the Kellogg Foundation for a number of years as an advisor for their national leadership program. It took me all over the world, and I was with uh, 50 incredibly remarkable men and women who came from academia, from business, from medicine, from uh, all walks of life, from government. And we worked together uh, to, to understand many aspects of leadership. One of the things that we did was to go to Outward Bound. Now, you have to understand that my idea of roughing it is a holiday inn without a pool. So when I am standing at the foot of a mountain that they tell me I'm going to climb, I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not at all happy, and I'm terrified. I'm terrified. I'm supposed to be one of the mentors for the group. Have any of you ever gone mountain climbing or rappelling? Well, Cindy, of course you have. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that story. <laughs> And you have as well, it, but it, it, the first time you tackle the mountain, it's a little bit disconnecting, I mean disconcerting, you know. Well, let me tell you about my lessons learned on the side of the mountain, because I think they're part of the story of resilience as well. It was a cold, cold morning in, in the uh, Colorado Rockies. It was what they call the Tennessee Mountain Range, and it was the range in the Second World War where the paratroopers came to uh, uh, actually master their uh, parachuting and, 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 and ruggedness. And, and, and it, was a really, it was a really pretty remarkable hill that we were confronted with, with different areas of terrain, easier, harder, and extraordinarily difficult. We are standing there in this early morning in September, September the 14th, I can still remember the day, and it was just cold, unbelievable, just cold in the morning, and you know, your hands tingled a little bit, and you had your jackets on, and we went there, and one of the men uh, who was going to lead us through this process said to us, are you afraid, are, are any of you here afraid? My hand went up immediately, be honest, yes, I'm terrified. Some people, oh no, and he said, to everyone, he said, you know, it's always better to go with people who have a little bit of fear. A little bit of fear, why? Because they don't take foolish risks. They take risks, but not foolish risks. Suddenly, everyone was around me because they knew. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to climb this kind of easily, you know. One of my fellow uh, advis advisors in the program was a woman named Radine Acevedo. Radine is out in um, the, uh, out in Colorado where she owns her own technological company. Radine was a little tiny lady and she had just discovered uh, uh, some three weeks earlier that she had MS. And she was in this high terrain in Leadville, Colorado, which is one of the highest points in the continental United States, dragging her um, oxygen tank through the mountains. And she said, you know, and I want to climb that mountain. And I said, Okay, okay, do you, uh, do you, you want to climb that? She said, I can do it, Anne, if you uh, will promise to cheer me all the way up to the top. Well, I said, I, I, I can do that. I can do that. A young man named David Snyder, who was uh, a, who's a big high official in the Air Force now, came down. He said, I want to teach you all something about the mountain. And this is a lesson. The mountain ahead of you looks... Um, it, it looks like, well, how can you possibly climb it? But he had us touch the side, 
and we discovered that there were rocks, that there were crevices, that, there, that it's not solid. There are actually things that you can touch as you go up. And that was a reassuring thing. Sometimes, you know, when you look at problems, you think there's no way around them, there's no way to do them, and then as you begin to feel them and look at them, you discover, no, no, here's a crack, here's a crevice, here's something I can do. You see already the lessons that we're beginning to learn on the side of the mountain? Well, Raydeen goes, <coughs> and she starts up the mountain, and I'm saying, come on, baby, you can do this, you can make it to the top. I'm a cheerleader, I believe it's okay to be a cheerleader, I believe it's really okay to tell people you can do this, and I'm going to help you do this. I think that's an okay thing to do. And um, she got to a point on the mountain where there were obviously two paths. And I said, Radian, I think you should go to the left, think you should make that left. Well, she went to the right. And she quickly scrambled all the way up to the top. But I remembered that why in the road. You know, there are always choices. So I, I attacked, I thought, I, I, I got to go next. Because if I don't go, I will not go. <laughs> you know, that's it. So I went. I started up and I tackled that mountain. It's just, you are tied in, by the way. You are tied and there is a long rope there and there's somebody at the top who is suffering, is a suffering, well, <laughs> that too. But they are, serving, they are serving as what they call the belayers. And so I started up that mountain as fast as I could go and I came to that Y in the road and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the left. She went to the right, but I'm going to the left because I think that's a faster way up to the top. Well, suddenly I realized I had nowhere to go. And I'm spread eagle holding on to the mountain. And I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I had this revelation. You cannot hold on to the side of the mountain and look where you're going. You're going to have to lean back. You're going to have to look at the mountain. You're going to have to trust the ropes, everything that's being held. It's kind of like salt probing a sovereign. You can't hold a problem like this around you. You have to sit back, look at it. And so I leaned back and I looked and I realized that there was a ledge there and that if I were going anywhere at all on the side of the mountain, I had to take this little fat leg and it had to reach higher than it had ever gone in its whole entire life and I had to make this remarkable leap of faith into that crevice. And that's what I did. I lifted my leg, I hoisted myself up, and I found myself resting in the ledge on this mountain and my heart was going <laughs> and I had a flashback. I had a flashback to the night that I had been president of the college in, in, and I still was president at Lake Michigan when I'd lost a millage. And I had to lay off all these people the next day. And I had to immediately go back again and start the millage all over. And I had never known such fear in my life because the loss of that particular millage was going to mean the loss of lots of jobs for some people, all kinds of things. I had this incredible flashback, and it was, it was but I thought, yes, you've known this kind of fear before, and you know what? You got through it then, you can get through it now. And all of a sudden I heard this voice that said, you're almost here. And I looked up and there was the face of the fellow who was the, my belayer. And, and I said to him, will you help me? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, screw you. I'm going to make it to the top of the mountain without you. And I did. And when I got there, he said, how do you feel? And I said, I'd rather be at Saks. I don't feel that good, but this is OK. I've done it. And so the next thing that I had to do, the next thing that I had to do was I had to serve as a belayer. Now, the belayer means that you are connected to someone who is at the bottom of the mountain who's coming up. And you are going to have to stay connected to them until they make their way to the top. Are you thinking about these in terms of resilience? Are you thinking about the stories here and what they mean about staying connected like that? So there we were, connected. I had no idea to whom I was connected. I had no idea. I had seen people that stayed on the side of the mountain for hours, people that just simply didn't have the courage to make it to the top, that were just 
caught. And they had had to go and get them and gently bring them to the top. And so there I was. Now I have to tell you the story that two young men that had been a part of the Benton Harbor community, Benton Harbor St. Joe community where I was, had, were also members of, they, they were the young, they, well they were not young, they were, they were young men in their 30s, 20, late 20s, early 30s. And <clears throat> when they made the selection process for these young individuals that we would choose because of their leadership skills and abilities, uh, uh, the, uh, they had to f go through an arduous selection process. We started with over 900 candidates and we reduced it down to 300 whom we interviewed all across the United States and then we reduced it to 50 whom we selected. Highly, highly competitive experience. There were two young men, one from St. Joe, one from Benton Harbor and if you know the stories of St. Joe and Benton Harbor, you know the stories of contrast. The young man from St. Joe was the head of the Economic Development Com uh, Commission and he's a great fellow. He's out in Park City, Utah now. He's done a, gr a tremendous, has a tremendous career in uh, economic development, real estate development, etc. And he was your traditional obvious young leader. And I had said to him, Mike, I think you should apply for this job. And the other young man, also a Mike, was one of the street leaders in Benton Harbor. I loved him. He represented all of the energy that was going to help to hopefully energize the city of Benton Harbor. And I said to him, Mike, I think you should apply. My two Mikes, we often, the three of us, the two Mikes and the old lady, would stand on the bridge between the two cities and say, ah, I wonder what we can do to make a difference here. Well, they called me from the Kellogg Foundation and they said, wait, wait, we can't possibly have two people from the same area, Anne. Which one would you take? And I said, you know, that's truly not my problem. <laughs> that's your problem. Both mics went. As I knew they would. As I knew they would because they were both good and they were both wonderful. But know this. I am sitting on the side of the mountain, belaying, bringing people up. When whose face should appear? but Mike from Benton Harbor. And both of us burst into tears on the side of the mountain because literally and figuratively, I had helped to bring him to the top. That's part of what you do every day with students. And you don't know that. That is part of the resilience that makes you who you are. That is part of the reason that you stay in an educational community. Because sometimes the benefits aren't that terrific. Your salaries suck. There are all kinds of things that aren't great. But you don't do it just for that. You do it because you care desperately about what it is you were doing. And if you were thinking about where else you were going to go, you couldn't think about of another place that you'd want to be. Because part of the reason that you do this is because you care desperately about people. And you know that. Deep inside, you know that. That's the values that Penny was talking about. Those are the things that make a difference to you every day of your life. There was one more lesson on the side of the mountain, and that was coming down the other side. Once you're at the top, you know you do have to come down. Well, you could walk down. In fact, I did walk down. I said, I'm not going to repel. There's nothing normal about going backwards down a mountain. <laughs> I'm not going to make that choice, so there not going to do it. And I walked down, but there was a one young man named Rand Coble from North Carolina, and he kept going up and down that mountain, and he kept repelling and repelling and repelling, and I said to him, Rand, why are you doing this? And he said, you know, the last time that I, um, the last time that I did this, I was actually with the paratroopers group, and the young man in front of me uh, actually fell into the mountain when he was repelling, and it killed him. And I have a terrible fear, and I have to overcome this fear, and that's what I'm trying to do today. And I thought, oh, well, golly, if he can do that, I better do it. I better do this. I need to do this. I need to finalize this experience. So I went back up the mountain, and I went over to where we were going to repel and go down. 
Now, you have to really depend on the system when that happens, because you have to depend on how they tied you into it. You have to know that uh, uh, you have to, the, your, your instructors have done a good job with this, and you have to pay attention to it. And so I had to trust the system, and I'm not good about that all the time, because if I am in control, I know it's going to be fine, and by golly, I wasn't in control of this, and I had to trust what was happening. And one of the young women who was from the University of Texas in San Antonio, who was one of my mentees, she said, I looked straight at you because I knew if I didn't look at you with just a certain amount of, you've got to do this, that you would say, I I'm through now. <laughs> you know? But I did that. And I went backwards down the side of the mountain. And when I reached the bottom, do you know how many arms embraced me? I was surrounded by people who put their arms around me and who said, good job, Ian. Good job. And there was another life-changing life uh, experience that happened there. I knew that if I learned to let go and really experience the free fall, that there would be arms to embrace me, that I would find a way down. I also knew at that point that I could leave the presidency and that I could do a different kind of life. And that it was all right, that it was all right, that I could redefine. Those were my lessons on the side of the mountain. My lessons on the side of the mountain. And I think it's important for all of us to think about the lessons on the side of the mountain. Let me just quickly come to some conclusion, because I think it's, it's about time for me. I believe that res resilience is a matter of choice. I believe that it is a matter of skill. I do believe it is skill. I think there are skill sets we have to have. We can be infinitely more resilient if we know what it is we're doing, really. For me, uh, resilience also is a matter of taking care of myself. Uh, it is a matter of respecting my environment, of respecting and of valuing those that are around me, really respecting and valuing those that are around me. It's a matter, really, of um, giving and not getting. And it is a matter of creating a future. Respecting the past, I think that is very, very important, but not living in the past. It is a matter of creating a future and knowing that we have a choice in creating the future. I um, was wandering through Schuler's yesterday and picking up books, as I'm inclined to do. And I found um, a, a new book called The Healing. And I'm not sure what it's about, but I leaf through books finding quotes sometimes. And so I have to give it. I don't even remember the name of the author, so I've sort of plagiarized this piece here. But I loved this. It says, facts can explain us, but only story will save us. If you want to destroy a people, destroy their story. If you want to empower a people, Give them a story to share. I ask you now to keep your resilience, to maintain your resilience. Give all those that you touch a story to share. That will make you so strong. That will make you so able to give again. That will make you so able to love. And really, my friends, that's what it's all about. It's a matter of love, and I love you all. And thank you for having me back, and I'll see you later. Have a great day. Was that OK? Thank you. Thank you. Was that OK? That was...